Well, I want to start today by telling you the story about a young man who, from superficial accounts, seemed like he was not going to be a success in life. It seemed like he was doomed to a life of mediocrity. He's from a family that was, you know, nothing special. They had no power of influence. He dropped out of high school at the age of 17 to pursue a job as he left his home at 17 also, by the way. He pursued a job as a shoe salesman. And he didn't seem all that great at it. I mean, he did have a knack for people, though. And even though that's what he got paid to do, what he enjoyed doing, what his pleasure was to do, was to win souls for Christ. And so he sought, he began to, to do that, just that. And it seemed from outside sources that he wasn't very good at it. Again, in his day, to hold evangelistic meetings in places like uh, movie theaters, abandoned town halls, and places like that, that wasn't really the norm. If you're successful, you did it in a church. This young man continued on, and he'd fill the pews, again, according to critics, with people that he just got off the street. And they'd say, well, he can't be that successful. He sought to become a member in a local church. His membership was rejected because he failed their oral assessment. Meaning, in their opinion, he wasn't biblically knowledgeable enough to be a member of the body of Christ. But he didn't let that discourage him. He continued on in the work that he enjoyed doing. And even whenever it seemed that he had some small measure of success, tragedy struck. His home burned down. Matter of fact, I think his home burned down twice, if I'm remembering that correctly. But he rebuilt. He had so much success with the people that he brought in, they gave and they donated to be able to build a YMCA in his hometown. But that also burned to the ground. But he raised money again. They built it back. So from many accounts, it didn't seem anything extraordinary at the time. And to top all of this, what was his method? What did he use? Did he go to school for a decade? Did he learn these fancy ways to get people in the church? No, his method was simply going up to a stranger in the city and saying, Excuse me, are you a Christian? And if they didn't have a good enough answer, or if their response was no, are you ready for this? This was his strategy. If they said no, what did he say? He said, well, why not? That's it. That's what he did. As a matter of fact, he was in public transportation one day as he remarked to a man near him and, and asked, excuse me, are you a Christian? And the man got annoyed. And he said, that's none of your business. To which this young man replied back, it absolutely is my business. That man suddenly had a smile on his face. And he looked at this young man and he said, then you must be D.L. Moody. Many of you know who D.L. Moody is. But a lot of the success he had in life, he didn't live to see, much like the people in Hebrews 11. He didn't get to preach in a lot of these big, beautiful buildings that were built and bear his namesake. He has a seminary, a Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois. I actually have a former colleague uh, from Indianapolis that's there right now. And even though he didn't get to see any of that success, his what he did on this earth still lives on. As a matter of fact, this young man probably wouldn't be preaching before you today if it wasn't for D.L. Moody. Many a days I had long commutes about almost 20 years ago now in Knoxville, Tennessee. As I drove to work out of county, by the way, as a young man that dropped out of high school even younger than him, I drive to these jobs that were extremely stressful and tasking, out of county, 
So that left me with a lot of time to listen to the radio. And as I dreaded going to work every morning and sometimes waking up again before the rooster even bats an eyelash, I would dread it so much, but I learned to take comfort in hearing the Word of God being preached on Moody Radio. It was there for me at, at stressful points in my life. And because of what God empowered him to do, I'm here before you today. So I told you that story because what's popular to believe, the way many people often look at others, is so often wrong. We don't look as God looks on people. So today you probably saw the title of today's message is In Defense of Jonah. So why don't you turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Jonah. As you're turning there, I'll just give a little context. We're going to turn to chapter 3 of this small book. Again, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. We, we, you just, if your finger was just there for the scripture, just turn a page over. So the context is, is, as we know this famous story, of course, he did eventually go to Nineveh. He preached, and the people listened. Now, there's historical and even scientific evidence as to why they may have listened. You may recall one of my first sermons here. Uh, my belief was that the reason that the world was so willing to give political and religious power over to the papacy in 538 was the signs going on around them. The earth was dark for nearly two full years. There were stars falling out of the sky. There, there, was, there was things that scared people. And so likewise with the Ninevites, it said that there was an eclipse in the mid-700s, just when Jonah was there. It also talked about famine and pestilence that had struck the Assyrians at the same time. So for all we know, their hearts were ready to hear something, hear some sort of message from God. And they responded, picking up in verse 10 of chapter 3, it says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Continuing in chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, uh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. I, I did that wrong again. So this prayer, this prayer is prayed angrily. I'm sorry, I, I practiced this. I tried to read it angrily, but you just can't read the attributes of God angrily. It's hard to do. It's, it's almost like if you make a British person mad and they're yelling at you or cursing at whatever, it still sounds pleasant. It's, it's hard to do. So again, picture that he's angry with God and he's saying these great qualities of God angrily. So continuing there, it says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, beginning here, in defense of Jonah, why would he say such a thing? Why would he wish for death? Well, to start with, I want everybody to know, I, I believe I've said it in different messages because it comes up from time to time. There's nothing wrong with what he said. He's being honest with his father, who is his friend, as you see from Scripture. He never fails to tell God how he's feeling. And even more so, Jonah is not alone in this prayer request. This unusual prayer request was prayed also by the prophet Jeremiah. Many of you probably remember Job praying this prayer. Even Elisha, who ironically never even experienced death. 
They all prayed this prayer to God. But why? The question is why? Why would he say that? Well, his enemies, the Assyrians in Nineveh, they were a ruthless, cruel people. So in order to understand why, we have to imagine we're living Jonah's life. We have to imagine that we live in a time far removed from today. Because today, when something bad happens in the world, who do they cry out to? Who do they say, you should have done something about it? The country you call home. Whenever America fails to do something about a crime against humanity, the whole international community is upset that we don't do something about it. But that didn't exist in Jonah's time. In Jonah's time, the Assyrians reigned unchecked. The Assyrians, again, were notoriously cruel people. Historical accounts of their cruelty say that their victims, the places they conquered, many deserts were turned red with the blood they spilled of their victims. Didn't matter if you're a woman, a child, a man, they had no mercy. They said that bones dammed up rivers. The victims of the Assyrians, their bones dammed up rivers. It said even in one Assyrian account that they ran out of space for all the bodies of their victims. Even kings were not safe from these ruthless people. Seems like there's an etiquette. If you conquer a kingdom, well, the king is spared. Maybe even kept on as an advisor. Not so with the Assyrians. They filleted the kings. Spread their skin out over pillars. Now, I apologize for the detail, but if you want to understand Jonah's anger, I think you need to hear some of it. Even crucifixion, the word from which we derive the word excruciating. Crucifixion may have been perfected, if an evil thing can be perfected, by the Romans. It may have been made known notoriously by Vlad the Impaler. But where did this idea of impaling human beings come from? The Assyrians invented it. And so as a man, especially a man who's so friendly with God, you know you're close to the one person. It's like being you know, the, the most favored ambassador to the United States if something happens to your country. You know it's going to be okay, right? No. He pleaded with God, can't you do something about this? And as a man, I feel for him. I feel the frustration of seeing the injustice all around you. Oh, if you want to get me angry, and I imagine many of you are the same, just show me someone harming somebody that's defenseless and thinking that they're going to get away with it. You're starting to get a small taste of how angry Jonah would have been. He wanted justice. He pled for it. But slowly and softly, the Lord responds. It says there in verse 4, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Notice here, Jonah didn't respond at this point. He just sort of pouted and left. Verse 5, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. This plant is so packed with meaning. It's where I'm probably going to spend more time than I should. 
The plant is a castor bean plant. This plant is filled with toxin. And I can't help but realize the irony of Jonah, his blood boiling with murderous anger, seeking refuge under the shade of a toxic plant. This castor bean plant, the seeds of which, if you were to ingest, they say, usually more than six, it can be fatal for you. It's had its uses throughout history, however. As a matter of fact, to this day, some people still use it to purge themselves if they induce something toxic. Before Ipecac syrup, there was castor bean or castor oil. Castor oil, um, I, I think it's still used in some places to induce labor. It, it does have some purpose, but it's largely been replaced. And so he seeks shelter under this plant. But this plant, as God is about to say, represents more than just itself. If you look closely at this plant and compare it with the city that God clearly compares it with, this plant represents a city. So cities in the ancient world, even I mean throughout Scripture from Genesis to Jonah and throughout, Cities often represent wicked places. They're evil because of the mass population. The many people come there for some level of comfort, hoping for success, hoping for some pleasure, seeking that they find. That's what the cities represent. Matter of fact, if you were in such a city in the ancient Near East, in the middle of these hot summers, with the desert sun beating down on you and the sand blowing in your face and having to breathe that through your nose, you enjoyed your time in the city. You go behind these giant walls, and if that sun's too much for you, at any point in the day, you can lie next to the walls and get a little shade, some relief from the sun, just as Jonah found relief from the sun under this plant. Even to this day, skyscrapers provide a shelter. If you're in a downtown in a big city, if the, the wind is too hard, if the sun is too much, just go and rest in the shade of a skyscraper. So that's what it represents. Relief of some sort, as it did for Jonah. But it represents even more than that. As we see here, Jonah refused to even lift a finger to help the Ninevites at first, just like this plant. I mean, after all, it was a worm that destroyed the plant. I've heard speculation that, well, maybe it was a giant worm, kind of like the fish. At the end of the day, it's still a worm. He could have stayed awake. He could have kept watch over his plant, and all he had to do was just lift a finger and flick it off. But he didn't, just like he didn't with the city. And so the plant represents so much more than just the comfort that he tried to find. This great city was so large, many times in the book of Jonah, he uses the word great to describe the city, to give you an idea of how large this city was. Because if, if you're still seething and thinking, yes, where is the justice? Why isn't the city destroyed? In Palestine, it was common for a large city to be about two acres walled in. And one of the greatest cities referred to in the book of Judges was referred to as Hazor. And that was ten times a normal city, 20 acres. Well, Nineveh was a hundred times that. Modern-day Mosul, Iraq, is built on its ruins. Nineveh was close to 2,000 acres, filled with people seeking relief. But continuing in the story, it says in verse 9, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, 
You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. So what's the reason God cites? Is it that while some of these people might still be okay and repent, God does not destroy the city because of their ignorance. Because so many of these people grew up in a place, they saw their parents, they saw their neighbors do wicked, atrocious things, and they didn't know any better. And God takes pity on them. Oftentimes in the Bible, such as Isaiah 59.1, I'll hold you with my righteous right hand. The right hand indicates the good things that you do, and sometimes the left can be the bad. And God says, they don't know the difference between the two. How could I hurt these? How could I destroy these people? What's most remarkable about this book, if I'm going to defend Jonah, this is why I go to chapter 4. Because, unfortunately, I think we've become accustomed to pointing the finger at prophets, kings, judges. Matter of fact, um, I had a comparison and in, in contrast planned in other scriptures of their responses compared to Jonah's. But for lack of time, we just, we're just going to stay in Jonah today. Oftentimes, we almost scoff at them. And we say, how could they do that? I mean, did he really think he's going to run away from God? I mean, we almost call them names sometimes in our Sabbath school. And, and I heard this at Southern at Seminary. We would have this negative view of Jonah, of Samson. I mean, how many times have we joked about Samson? Oh, really? Come on. He, he had a weakness for women despite all that? Well, let's pause there for a second. Has anybody ever, anybody in here, do you know what it feels like to be the strongest man who ever lived? No. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Does anybody in here, have you ever bench pressed a temple? No. We don't know what it's like. So whenever we're reading these stories about God's people who he used to do miraculous things, we need to remember that. We need to remember, instead of looking at Jonah and seeing the young man who made these mistakes, who had so much anger in his heart, why don't we look at the actual author? Because the actual author of this book was not that young man. The actual author was an experienced Jonah who had learned the greatest lesson of his life. The lesson that Jonah learned that to value human, or excuse me, all life, to value life, is the greatest lesson any of us can learn in this lifetime. It's what Jesus came to teach us, to love one another. Valuing human life is what Jonah understood from this message. And as a testament to that, to support my argument in defense of Jonah, how does he close the story? That's a cliffhanger. You're wondering, where's part two? Is this a to be continued? No. He doesn't try to give any of his words in defense of his behavior because he knows it was appalling. In retrospect, he knows it was terrible to think such a thing and condemn so many people, so many innocent, with the guilty. And so a much wiser man has written this book that it might be an eternal lesson for each and every one of us that every time we think someone's not worthy, every time we think someone or some place should be destroyed, ask yourselves first, what, what did God say about that? Because God says, should I not pity them? Translation. God here says, should I not pity that awful, that terrible, that wicked place still has some people in it? Should I not pity them? 
Fast forward to the New Testament. How many times did it say Jesus looked on them and had compassion? Jesus looked on him and loved him. Jesus looked and took pity on him, just as God took pity on Nineveh. As a matter of fact, we see God's character come through. And Jonah, by the way, is giving this the platform. I think Pastor Jeremy on on Wednesday's prayer meeting was talking about how the most important thing is how you end the story, right? If you skip forward, if there's anything you can read, you want to read how it ends. And so Jonah leaves God's words as the last words because it is the last word. And by doing that, by leaving with that thought, should I not pity them, we see God's character as we saw it on the cross. God incarnate. What did he say about those who were crucifying him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They too were ignorant. The same reason, the same example that God cited for his reason to not destroy the Ninevites, the same reason, the same argument he gave not to destroy the Romans. But there's a bigger picture here. After all, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We see the great controversy, right? There's an even bigger picture here. I speculate how many times, especially, I guess I moved to a bad spot, especially at the crucifixion. Whenever you think of Job and you think of the heavenly council, those who come before God, the sons of God, the angels, whenever they come to and from work every day, whenever they, whenever they come from this earth and they report back to God, if you think you have a bad drive to work, bad commute, imagine how they feel. Imagine how they felt, how all these innocent creatures who had never sinned felt whenever they saw Jesus being crucified, despite the fact that he had done nothing wrong. I imagine that some of them pled for justice. And they said, Heavenly Father, can't you, can't you stop this? These people are wicked. This planet down here is purely evil. Can you please destroy it? And yet, what would God's response have been? You see some of those people down there? Should I not have pity on them? 2,000 years ago, way before any of us were a twinkle in our parents' eye, God knew that we would be born one day. He knew that we would sin, that we would continue in the same folly, the same mistakes as Jonah. But yet he waited. He waited until you reached a point in your life where you started living your life in honor of him, where you learned the lesson from Jesus Christ to love others as you love yourself. Each and every one of us today is a testament that God says, despite the outcry against this planet, there are perhaps still that have not been born yet that will one day be saved. If God were to come back now, they would never exist. And God says, should I not have pity on them? Should he not have pity? If you can realize why God has pity on others, you can then apply this to your own life. I implore you, do not underestimate the power of Jonah's message. Matter of fact, the Hebrews, the the Jewish people still understand this. They read this book aloud on the Day of Atonement because the inherent value of the message that is taught. So how much more, whenever we see how evil this world is, especially that the news gets so many details and video footage of what happens all over the world, whenever we think badly of this place and we cry out for destruction, pause for a moment and ask yourselves, should you not have pity? These people are ignorant. They have no one to teach them. If you haven't talked to them personally, if you haven't pleaded with them and tried to teach them the way to eternal life, 
then how can you call out for destruction? The way the book of Jonah ends is how we defend his character. Again, a wiser, more experienced, older man who learned the greatest lesson he ever had. His words continue to be a lesson for each and every one of us today. He learned from his mistake. Are we going to learn from ours? This book, again, the strategy of ending so suddenly, so abruptly, is a strategy that I try to implore in preaching. Obviously, I'm not the best preacher. And sometimes people have told me, they've complimented, and they've said, you should have preached more, or you should have a part two. And many of you are here right now, you probably remember what I said, that if you feel that way, then I've done my job. I've done what I was supposed to do, created a hunger in you to go home and study more and talk about it more. Come talk with me after church about it more. Created that in you. And so likewise, the book of Jonah creates that in all of us because without him just ending abruptly with silence, we wouldn't realize. We think, you know, what a fool. We look at his life and think, what was he doing? But him ending with God's words, should I not pity others, is proof that he learned his lesson. So sometimes we can say so much more with silence than we ever can with words. A wise pastor told me it's good to end with a story. But unless I can end with scripture, I'll end with this. To the heart that's truly listening... We can say so much more with silence than we ever can with words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for the lesson of your servant Jonah. We praise you for the lessons that you taught him and that he had the humility to share his mistakes with us so that we might learn from them also. For if perhaps he wouldn't have put these mistakes in scripture if he wouldn't have said how fallible he was maybe we wouldn't have learned these lessons so we're, we're grateful for that we're grateful for his humility we're grateful for the lesson you taught him and we pray that each one of us can learn if not by Jonah some other way of your teaching we pray each one of us can learn that most important lesson that we have to learn in this life to value life as you do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.